Good morning, Church of the Wrecking Yard. What a great joy it is to be with you this morning. How Tina and I have missed each of you, but be assured that we think of you so often. Pray uh, for many of you daily as the Lord continues to bring you to our own hearts. We reach out and we uh, hug you and love you. And uh, just declare to you what a blessing each of you are and uh, um, all of the uh, new uh, uh, followers that are coming on board Facebook and uh, YouTube and uh, the podcasts and, um, and anything else that we're able to uh, send out. Uh, uh, we just want to welcome you <clears throat> and thank you uh, for being part of what we call the Wrecking Yard Ministry. The Wrecking Yard Ministry is men and women like yourselves that have been impacted with an encounter of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an encounter um, that uh, God desires to wreck you and I to never ever be the same again. Regardless uh, of how you have uh, uh, come into the kingdom of God, uh, whatever your vehicle looks like, be assured as a wrecking yard in the natural looks like, uh, God is able to restore all that the uh, canker worm, the caterpillars, the locusts uh, uh, has eaten in your life and mine. So don't be discouraged. Know that God is with you and for you and his power is available for you for you and I today and forevermore. Tina and I uh, flew back into the beautiful uh, state of Texas and uh, uh, Houston slash Sugar Land early Wednesday morning about one o'clock in the morning. I actually had to think when I woke up this morning, when did we get here? What week is this? Uh, we have been doing quite a bit of traveling. We returned from the Northwest where we had a couple of meetings and also we had a, a funeral. And uh, so uh, with that, uh, I would ask and covet your prayers. Uh, the uh, Lord is opening up uh, lots of doors and uh, <clears throat> we are asking for the timing of uh, such doors and uh, which ones to uh, try to do. Um, we have uh, scheduled next uh, week Honduras and Nicaragua, but there are some safety concerns that are flaring up in the areas that uh, we um, have been uh, asked to come in terms of ministry to those churches. We also have invitations uh, to uh, 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 San Antonio, California, North Dakota, uh, Canada, um, of course, India, and a host of other places that we're endeavoring to uh, see God's wisdom on and His will to be done. I want to thank uh, uh, the uh, seven of you that were able to send in your gifts, your offerings, and uh, and your and uh, those areas um, uh, this month. We have uh, been given enough by each of uh, you uh, to uh, purchase a new motorcycle for one of the ministers in a very, very, very poor uh, area in uh, Mexico. Um, and uh, we have ordered uh, the motorcycle, and um, it will take uh, quite some time for it to be delivered, but I'm going to uh, take photos uh, of it. If we're not there, I'll have uh, the minister take photos of the uh, purchase of the motorcycle uh, that we uh, and you have been able to provide for him. He had been walking on foot to a number of villages, um, and uh, it is a great joy to be able to uh, invest into to, uh, those that uh, God allows uh, that are moving in uh, areas of deep sacrificial uh, lives for his kingdom and his namesake, all a work of grace. Yes. I want to again thank all of you for your emails, your textings, and some letters that have come into the ministry, um, thanking us and uh, God for the messages on forgiveness and a host of things that have been uh, said and done. We again appreciate all that uh, uh, encouragement and love that you have shared. We uh, want to hear from you how we might pray for you and how we might uh, endeavor to minister to you, um, and so please let, let us 
us know uh, that's most important for us. Now, uh, this morning, uh, we want to endeavor to bring a, a small, uh, short sermonette, um, um, and, uh, and then we'll move into a, a song and come back to, uh, to a message. And so, uh, if you have your Bible uh, available, I want you to open it up uh, to uh, 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 23. 1 Kings chapter 7 verse 23 and uh, the um, uh, sermonette is entitled God's kingdom belongs to the oxen. God's kingdom belongs to the oxen. As you turn to 1 Kings chapter 7 verse 23, a big shout out to those of you uh, in the Pacific Northwest that are, uh, uh, have uh, uh, text and emailed the ministry that you are up and at them this morning. Uh, roll out of bed there, it's uh, 8 o'clock. Uh, those of you in Idaho and Oregon and Washington and California, Glendale, a shout out to you there as well. Um, those of you uh, in the uh, south and uh, and the East Coast, good morning to you, um, and, and, and uh, namaste to my beautiful brothers and sisters in India and uh, Central America, and uh, um, we just uh, say we love you, and, and good morning, good evening, whenever this finds you. So uh, 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 23 God's kingdom belongs to the oxen, and so let's read this uh, together this morning. I'm reading out of the King James Version, and it's talking about Solomon's temple. We have seven temples mentioned in your Bible, and this is one of the temples that is uh, mentioned, Solomon's temple. And uh, this was a, a, a aspect of the temple that God uh, commanded uh, to be built uh, for Solomon's temple temple. Verse 23, and he uh, made a molten or a brass uh, bowl or uh, a sea, uh, King James says, 10 cubits from one brim to the other. It was round all about. Its height was five cubits, around seven and a half, eight feet tall. And a line uh, of 30 cubits, uh, it did encompass round about around its 15 to 20 feet in diameter and under the brim of the round uh, uh, bowl um, as it were um, there were uh, 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 knobs King James says um, two rows etc etc was a design feature verse 25 key verse and this um, uh, brass uh, bowl it stood uh, upon 12 oxen and three looking towards the north, and uh, three looking towards the south, three looking towards the east and to the west. And um, the water or the sea was set upon them or above them, and uh, all of the hinder parts of the oxen were uh, pointed inward. In verse 26, it was a handbreadth thick, and the brim thereof was filled uh, to the brim like a cup with uh, flowers and lilies, and it contained 2,000 baths, uh, basically uh, in terms of the uh, amount of water. Now, I'm going to put a, uh, a picture up there if you can see that. Now, this was um, uh, the Temple of Solomon, uh, different in respect to other temples, but you can see there on that photo of this uh, massive, um, I think King James called it a molten sea or, or a brass bowl filled with water with 12 oxen, <clears throat> three of the oxen pointing north, as you can see, three of the oxen uh, pointing south, three pointing east, and three pointing west. Now, oftentimes, uh, beloved, in the Old Testament, many uh, of the items uh, there are uh, symbolic in respect to uh, uh, what uh, spiritually God wants you and I to receive. Paul, in the book of Corinthians, said first the natural and then the spiritual oxen oftentimes, most often, it actually represents you and I. I have a host of scriptures to support that symbolism. And so with that, I want to uh, just to share with you a, a small aspect of, of God's kingdom belongs to the oxen. 
I sent out a text to many of you, and I mentioned to you, I trust you allow yourself in your Christian walk to just plod along without fanfare nor fireworks. I'm going to say that again. I want you, uh, the scriptures declare, uh, that God wants you and I to allow yourself, as it were, the ox, to plod along without fanfare nor fireworks. I mentioned in the text, as much as I enjoy God's power encounters with healings and deliverance and salvation, His kingdom belongs to the oxen. Solomon's temple had a giant bowl of water sitting on 12 oxen. And uh, these uh, oxen, again, represented God's people, plodding animals, taking the water, which is symbolized of God's Word and God's Spirit, John 4 and John 7. And, and so uh, many people I encounter become very discouraged and uh, begin to become uh, apathetic in their Christian walk because they don't have and don't see a bunch of uh, spiritual fireworks and fanfare in some of those areas that uh, we all desire to, uh, to demonstrate and to be part of. But God's kingdom belongs to the oxen. It doesn't belong to the fireworks and the fanfare and the, uh, um, you know, small uh, times of explosions that, uh, that we uh, just embrace and are thankful for. Um, but the kingdom of God belongs to the plodding of the Christian, going north, south, east, and west, just plodding along, being faithful and taking the word of God that they have within their life and the spirit of God that they carry and, uh, and plodding along in their day to day life. I know for some, again, that I have uh, spoken to and have received uh, 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 texting and emails from you feel discouraged and you feel, again, um, a sense of uh, not doing enough and not doing more and not uh, demonstrating enough of God's power. But I want to encourage you today that, again, beloved, the kingdom of God belongs to the oxen. It's the day-to-day -day plodding along, getting up, endeavoring to be faithful to God as you go to work. As God unfolds your day, as you mingle with people in the world you live with, employers, employees, uh, family, friend, and whomever God brings you in contact with, you and I are that oxen, and I want you to be at peace with that. And allow God to choose when those times of uh, deep encounters and demonstrations uh, uh, of, of his power uh, and leave that to him. We can reach for them and pray for them. But again, don't be discouraged and don't become apathetic and disappointed in yourself that somehow you haven't arrived yet. You and I and the kingdom belongs to the oxen. I need a good shout and an amen out there because many of us, again, are feeling discouraged and you should not feel that way. You just keep plodding along. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. So just turn right a little bit, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19, and I want you to see just a small portion here. Uh, I've pulled just a few uh, uh, texts out of uh, God's Word concerning the ox, uh, and we see here in chapter 19, verse 19, uh, that uh, Elijah uh, was uh, moving along in his prophetic ministry. In verse 19 of chapter 19 of 1 Kings, we see here that he found Elisha. Elisha means uh, uh, God is salvation. And it says here in verse 19 that he found Elisha, the son of Japhat, who was plowing with what? Twelve yoke of oxen before him. And with the twelfth, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Now just circle that twelve yoke, twelve 
And the number of your Bible is God's government. It's governmental authority. It's the strength of uh, God's government and authority in your life and mine. I can go through a host of scriptures um, declaring the number 12, 12 apostles and 12 disciples and, and uh, 12 thrones and on and on and on. But we find here that Elijah found a man by the name of Elisha. Now, notice Elisha, he was working with the oxen, working with the oxen, and uh, the oxen uh, came to a numeric PowerPoint of 12, the number of God's authority and God's government, you see, as you and I see the value of just plotting and, uh, and small times and small steps of praying may not be these uh, in, uh, elongated prayer times. It may not be these long times of reading God's Word. Let God's grace uh, uh, fuel um, these areas within your life and mine. Ask Him to do and to cause it uh, and the hunger and thirst to take place. But it's the small plodding with an ox with your life. And as that grows, God brings other men and women to you uh, to share and to help them plow um, the fields that God has put them in. Here he was, Elisha, growing uh, in the plotting dynamics of his life. And now a prophet God sent to him. He cast his prophetic mantle over Elisha, declaring to him, this now is the time to move in uh, to a position of a prophet, uh, for you have been faithful in the plotting along with the oxen. Now, Elisha, never lost the anchor of the uh, aspects of plotting uh, and being part of the community of the ox. Just because God moved him positionally didn't change the nature and the character of Elisha's heart. And yet he was found by Elijah through the handiwork of God and, and Elijah threw the mantle uh, upon Elisha and you know that that was the first steps uh, to bringing forth the mentoring of Elisha all because of the understanding, the pl plotting and the movements of faithfulness in the life of Elisha. I want you to see here, in, uh, and you could just note it without uh, necessarily taking the time to find it. Uh, uh, the Bible says here uh, in Deuteronomy 22, 4, it says, if you see your countryman's ox have fallen down on the way, you shall certainly help him or her to raise that ox up. What's he saying He's basically endeavoring to say to you and I that you don't allow jealousy in uh, the aspects of uh, uh, your Christian walk with another ox, another individual that has fallen. Uh, you don't uh, have any sense of glee and joy and happiness when you see your countryman's ox that have fallen down on the way. You are called to help raise him up again. And so I want to encourage you and I uh, that uh, when we see fallen uh, men and women within the Christian community, it shouldn't cause you and I to have a sense of joy. And jealousy should not be a, a portion of your heart and mind, no matter matter who it is, the name of Jesus Christ, the name of Christian, and the name of God has uh, been uh, um, uh, blemished, and we should endeavor to help raise that individual up, um, as your scriptures declare, lest we fall. The Bible says here uh, in Psalms 144 verse 14, God says that my oxen will be able to bear great loads, that God is going to strengthen, and I'm going to pray that uh, even now. Uh, and I'm going to lay hands on my own uh, uh, big head and uh, pray uh, that God would strengthen you and I to bear great loads. Uh, I'm 64 now. I want to thank you for all of you that sent those presents. And <laughs> uh, But uh, nonetheless, as you get older, naturally there can come um, a, uh, a diminishing of strength, but I'm going to believe that God will cause you 
and I to bear great loads for him. And I pray that over you. Whatever challenges and whatever weight that you are feeling and you're um, having to bear at your workplace. And the stress of a family, the stress of a marriage someone's going through, and the uh, stress and worry and anxiety of a child uh, that is wayward or is moving here and there, I pray that God will uh, uh, bring forth His divine strength in your life that you will be able to continue to plod and that you won't fall uh, to the wayside. Another scripture I want you to see, Proverbs 14.4. Proverbs 14.4, that's worthy of uh, all scripture, worthy to see and to underline. So I'm going to give you a minute on this one. Uh, Proverbs 14.4. And some of uh, uh, the uh, people that I uh, uh, FaceTime with and call uh, each week uh, that are uh, uh, growing in uh, God, uh, um, I've uh, asked you to put those uh, uh, markers um, in your Bible to know where the books are, so I'm smiling knowing that those of you are finding those at an easier pace. Um, I uh, had those and would have them again if if I um, didn't uh, mark this before I got up in front of you. Proverbs 14.4 Where there is no ox, the manger is empty or clean. But an abundant of harvest comes through the strength of the ox. Going to say that again. Where there is no oxen, the manger is empty or the manger is clean. And with, uh, uh, but an abundant uh, harvest increase, revenue comes through the strength of the ox. What's all of that mean? Uh, that means a couple of things that if you and I don't realize that uh, uh, within the need for an oxen, uh, the strength is going to um, be necessary. Um, basically, uh, without pulling out all of the Hebrew words, is that if there's no oxen in the stall, there's not going to be any harvest. If there's no plodding at all, um, there is isn't going to be any revenue, any increase. It also means this, that uh, with, uh, without uh, uh, engaging with the ox or with other people um, in respect to your life, the, the manger is clean. But when you and I bring that oxen into the stall, there is going to be at times, there's going to be mess, there's going to be debris, there's going to be areas that the oxen uh, creates, but you Yet in that areas of mess and struggle and, and challenge, there's going to come an abundance of harvest and strength that will come from that ox. So just because, uh, you know, it's not just uh, you and God, uh, that's used to be my life, it's me and God and I don't need anybody else, but he wants you and I uh, to get out and to touch people in uh, the places that you go, to, to the store and to the workplace, etc., uh, also, one more scripture here, Deuteronomy 22.10, you shall not plow an ox and a donkey together. Wow, <laughs> what's all that mean? He talks a lot about mixture, and uh, I pull this out in respect to the ox, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Now, you know don donkeys in your Bible are, and, and in the natural are stubborn animals, they are unruly animals, they'll hiss at you and sometimes spit at you and he's uh, mentioning a host of things in respect to your life and mine uh, one I'll uh, in a couple of things one is um, let me just talk to some of the entrepreneurs that are starting a business you want to be very careful that you don't uh, endeavor to plow uh, with a donkey you want to have another ox with you if you're going to partner in a business I share that with you experientially um, that I wasn't mentored and it took uh, some of these areas that caused great heartache, great hardship and financial loss uh, because we, uh, on one business, we had joined ourselves to a donkey. 
didn't realize uh, that the Lord doesn't want that kind of mixture uh, within uh, those kinds of settings. He says, now, uh, do not plow with an ox and a donkey. Now, let's talk about relationships. Uh, you don't want to get involved with a donkey. Um, you can, uh, you know, realize that having someone with you doesn't cure loneliness. Okay, you can uh, be married to someone and be deeply lonely in your life, and you don't want to compromise. Talking to somebody listening right now, you don't want to compromise um, your uh, need and desire to have someone, even if they are a donkey. He says, now here's a principle. Don't try to be married and live life with a donkey. Um, you don't plow together that way. It's such a blessing and a joy uh, for Tina and I to pray together, to cast out demons together, to do kingdom life together, uh, to be best friends after 38 years. Now, some of you um, have uh, married a donkey before you realize what had taken place. Now, we can pray that God changes the heart and the framework of, <laughs> of that donkey and that he or she becomes an ox and I pray for that faith over your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, okay. lastly, 1 Timothy 5.18, uh, Paul um, uh, sharing with um, uh, Timothy and you and I, he said, you shall not muzzle the ox while he or she is threshing um, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now, I'm not trying to get your money. I'm sharing with you again. The ox is referring to a man or a woman or to whomever is working in the vineyard of God's kingdom. He said, you shall not muzzle the ox while he or she is threshing out um, uh, the, the kingdom work for the labor is worthy of his wages. Now, again, I'm not trying to get any money from you. Uh, God is uh, endeavoring and has uh, sustained Tina and I through aspects of uh, 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 investments that uh, if, uh, he has continually uh, been faithful to support us in the journey and the season that we are in right now, and we give him great thanks, especially from where we have come from 38 years ago. I took my bride home to a 12 by 60, 50 year old trailer trash, and I said, welcome home, my beloved <laughs> bride. And so uh, to see where God has brought us, we are so deeply thankful and grateful. But I remind you of this, that you don't want to muzzle and uh, the ox uh, um, that is endeavoring to thresh out and the labor is worthy of his or her wages. So I come all the way back around um, and just a small aspect of this sermonette that God's kingdom belongs to the oxen. Don't uh, seek uh, the fireworks and the fanfare necessarily. Realize that God's kingdom belongs to the oxen. The plotting of your life and mine, the day-to-day -day faithfulness of getting up and having, uh, as God's grace allows you, a time to pray or going to work and you're worshiping Him and you're, and you're loving the unlovely. You're endeavoring to uh, give a smile to those that haven't seen one or a, or a, a word of encouragement to, to the unencouraged, uh, uh, you know what? It's just it's just plotting. It's just those uh, areas of day to day faithfulness that I want to highlight in your life. I want to say to you, you continue uh, to be a, a, an ox for him, north, south, east, and west. John 4, take the water of his word, take his Holy Spirit into wherever he sends you, and let that light shine for him. Just, just that light emanating out of you is going to attract um, those that uh, God would bring into your path. And beloved, the harvest is ripe uh, for the glory of of Jesus Christ. I don't want anyone else uh, to feel like they are um, disenfranchised or you haven't arrived yet. Listen, beloved, there, there, weren't, uh, there were exploits in this book, uh, but they didn't happen daily. And as much as I want power encounters, uh, the kingdom belongs to the ox. It's day to day. It's plodding along. It's getting up. It's taking care of the kids. It's taking care of your wife. 
your husband. It's being a faithful employee that shows up a little early for work. It is one who is thankful uh, to have that uh, job as God has uh, allowed you to have. It is, it is a life of thankfulness daily and day to day. So I want to pray for you and I that you never lose sight that God's kingdom belongs to the oxen. Look what he said. It was a massive bowl of water. And he said, look, take the oxen, not the leopard. Uh, you know, not, uh, you know, these, these fast animals. He could have picked any animal he wanted uh, to uh, demonstrate spiritually and symbolically of how this word is going out. But it's the plotting. You go to whichever country you go to, um, it is the same day-to-day -day aspects. And, uh, and then gradually, the whole world is covered with his glory. And you and I get to be part of that. What a beautiful thing it is. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, are so grateful that you have even allowed us to uh, journey and to take your holy, beautiful word, the gospel that brings good news you have allowed us to bring and to fill us uh, with your Holy Spirit. And I pray in the name of Jesus, no one listening or watching this uh, presentation would feel discouraged, disenfranchised, would feel um, apathetic and, uh, and like they don't measure up and they haven't had exploits, that somehow by your Holy Spirit that you would uh, remind us that your kingdom belongs to the ox. May we be faithful to plod day to day, week to week, and month to month. And one day, like Job, you will cut us from this world and the tapestry, and you will hang us from the balconies of heaven, declaring all of the beauty that has been done by you and through these precious saints. I bless them. I thank you for them in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I'll see you in just a few minutes. We have a song and then we will come back and uh, bring forth uh, a message um, this morning. God bless you. My past became my prison. Love was waiting with the key My story was my failure Now my story is redeemed
your nail-scarred hands Where there was sin and shame, the cross now stands The grave no longer tells me who I am Cause my freedom's written in those nail-scarred hands What a beautiful song. I've been drinking of that for about uh, at least <laughs> a week. And uh, I just so uh, enjoy the, uh, uh, the words and I sh so enjoy the, uh, the theology and the truth of that scripture. Uh, I wrote here, Jesus Christ, the greatest man in history. Again, his name is Jesus. He had no servants Yet they called him master. He had no degree, and yet he's called the teacher. He had no medicines, and yet they called him the healer. He had no army, and yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, and yet he's conquered the world, sin and death. He committed no crime, and yet he cru he they crucified him. And yes, he was buried in a tomb, but yet he lives. If you have your Bible, if you would uh, stand with me and uh, um, open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. First Corinthians chapter six, verses nine through eleven. This I had another uh, message, uh, kind of already worked up and ready to go uh, this morning, uh, but I received this uh, email um, about a day ago, and so uh, forgive me if it seems a little bit. Uh, uh, um, not manicured, but I wanted to try to address this situation. And, and I'll read the letter to you without the individual's name. It said, Dear Pastor Steve, thank you so much for your ministry. I've been really touched and challenged and inspired by your teachings. But yet I have this confession to you and to no one else have I shared it with. I do have faith that Christ has forgiven me. And forgiven me my sins. And I'm endeavoring in the process of forgiving those that have hurt me. That's been a powerful revelation to me if I don't. But I'm still feeling dirty and shamed and guilty for my past sexual sins and recklessness with my body. It is affecting and has affected my intimacy and my relationship with my wife of six years. Do you have any words of counsel for me whenever you get time? Great thankfulness. And he shared his name. And so the title of this uh, message is God's Forgiveness for Your Body. God's Forgiveness for Your Body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Paul writing here uh, while he was in Corinth, Greece. He said uh, here, Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, or uh, lesbianisms in those areas, nor abusers in themselves with mankind. Verse 10, nor thieves, <clears throat> nor covetous ones, <clears throat> nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Interesting, there were 10 of those, and 10 is the number of the world's system. And verse 11, key verse, beloved, if you got a pen uh, and highlighting this, he said, Paul, verse 11, as such were, were some of you. I want you to circle uh, and highlight and put stars. And um, he goes, and such were, 
notice, were some of you. But you have been washed, and you have been sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. He goes through these ten areas making sure that deception does not again move into our thinking and our belief system and theology. And he declares to you these ten areas. He limited those to ten. I'm sure there's a bunch more as you read in the book of Revelation. He lists another uh, ten of those as well. But the point I'm sharing with you isn't the debauchery of my life and yours, of what your past past sins were but it is in verse 11 he declares but as some of you were past tense and he goes on to say that you have been washed and you have been sanctified and you have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We'll pull some areas out of that shortly. Now, uh, one last scripture. Uh, go uh, back to uh, turn left and just go to Romans. One book back. Book of Romans. Again, written uh, to those in Rome by Paul. Romans chapter 5, and it is verse 20. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. I'll give you a minute to see it, and again, work your book, because the book will work, okay? The book will work. Verse 20, moreover, the law entered that our sins or offenses uh, might abound. In other words, he says, look, sin has been shown, the law has shown you where you and I sin. Why? It will drive us the need to be forgiven, a need to uh, receive a Savior for my sins. That's why the, the Bible says the law was given to show us that we are in need of a Savior and forgiveness for our sins. Key verse right here but where sin abounded grace did abound much more where sin has abounded grace abounded much more again we have taught in the past uh, regardless of the wickedness and sins you see around you and I in the daily uh, lives uh, of, of um, the uh, prophetic time table that we are in and sins are continuing to escalate just realize that when sin abounds grace comes in and abounds much more there is a, a rising of grace above the areas of sins known to mankind okay let's pray father I thank you uh, in the name of Jesus for your uh, people I am so shocked at times and amazed that even though there will be a message that's almost two hours long you will gather uh, your hungry elect um, uh, and, 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 and they will uh, uh, listen and feed and, and grow upon your holy word and I would pray um, that you would uh, grace me in my uh, weakness and my uh, inabilities uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to speak and to connect and, uh, and I ask uh, that you would do a mighty work within my life today uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You may be seated. This is uh, a part, literally a part three of a, a, a short series that we're doing on forgiveness. We have part one and part two uh, we have taught, and they're on YouTube and Facebook and uh, podcasts, I believe, and it's, uh, which were the greatest uh, deception why many Christians aren't going to be saved. And this is part three, again, uh, because of a, a letter from a, uh, from a man concerning uh, sexual sins uh, and with his body. God's forgiveness for your body, part three. What is the only sin in your Bible that caused God the Father to leave heaven and come to earth? I'm going to ask the question again. What is the only sin, according to your Bible, that caused God the Father to leave heaven, to leave his home, his habitation, and actually come to earth? Did you know there uh, was and is a sin that actually moved God in that respect that it caused him to lead his abode, his habitation, his home, uh, to come to, your, to the earth? This sin 
is uh, what I declare and what I see to be the most preve uh, uh, prevalent pandemic in the world that we live in today besides unbelief. I'm going to say that again. This sin I'm going to share with you is what I uh, see to be the most prevalent sinful pandemic within the world we live in today besides unbelief. This sin in your Bible that caused God to leave heaven and come to earth is a sin that is so easily accessible by children, by adults, by black, white, red skin. There is no uh, discrimination with sins. There's no racism with sins. It has infected every race, every skin color, every generation culture. Nations, governments, marriages, family, ministries, ministers, education. There are only a small percentage of people living on the earth today that have not been affected with this sin's poison. What, what is the only sin in your Bible that caused God the Father to leave heaven and come to earth? It's found in Genesis chapter 18 verses 20 through 21. I'll read it to you. What is the only sin in your Bible that caused God to leave heaven? To leave his home and come to earth? Genesis 18, 20 through 21. And the Lord said, God, the Father, Yahweh, Elohim, uh, Adonai, because of the outcry, what is happening in Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sins, and sin is so very grave to me, I will go down to see whether they have done all together according to that which is coming up before me, the cry that has come up before me, and I will then know. Now remember, beloved, it isn't that God doesn't know what is happening. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He knows you and I. <laughs> he knows everything about all things. That's why he is God. He is speaking after the manner of men, declaring to you and I that he is coming from heaven, coming down to earth because there has been a cry of such abominable sins that have ushered up unto him. And, and what, uh, without taking too much time, what he was endeavoring to do was to invoke um, his servant Abraham uh, and uh, to bring him into a place of understanding the deep power of intercession and standing in the gap for wickedness in the cities that he is, uh, that he is part of and he has family in, Sodom and Gomorrah, you see. He said to Abraham, uh, Abraham said to God, if, if, if I understand you right, if there's 50 righteous, will you relent on uh, bringing forth judgment? And God says, absolutely. And he went through all the way down to 10 people. And God says, if you find 10, I will relent judgment. Again, one of the uh, major uh, uh, issues God was endeavoring to instruct Abraham, we are children of Abraham, the need for intercession and standing in the gap for the wickedness of the nation that we are living in and the nations, okay? And so what is and what was this uh, only sin that your Bible uh, uh, declares where it moved God to come down to earth, uh, notably here, Sodom and Gomorrah, it was primarily sexual sins, sexual sins and you could note second peter uh, chapter 2 verse 7 it underlines the sins of sodom and gomorrah that were primarily listen to my words primarily they were sexual sins taking place now sodom and gomorrah without diverting too much had other sins besides listen to my words again please sexual sins or sins of the flesh most often christian people focus just on sins of the flesh sexual sins and, uh, and areas uh, that involve the carnal man. And God speaks most often on sins of the spirit, pride, haughtiness, covetousness. Those are areas that, uh, that he speaks of. And so Sodom and Gomorrah had more than just sins of the flesh. But that is a large proportion of why he left heaven to come to earth. And, uh, and we see other aspects of Sodom and Gomorrah and their sins found in Ezekiel chapter 16, 48 through 50. 
other sins in Sodom and Gomorrah. God declares uh, that in Sodom and Gomorrah, here were other sins of her. She had pride. That's what it says. She had excess food that she continued to consume upon herself. And she lived in prosperous ease and did nothing for me. And she did not even care about the poor and the needy. And they, Sodom and Gomorrah, were haughty. And thus their sexual lives were an abomination before me. And so judgment came. And so I want to just bring you and I... A Again, coming all the way back to the letter that the gentleman sent you and I. And again declare God's forgiveness for your body and for my body. Now let me share with you some research and then we'll get to uh, uh, how this is going to biblically take place in your life and mine. Uh, according to... Uh, 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 Pew Research and Nelson Study Research Company. This is their reports as of last year concerning internet pornography in the United States. How much pornography is accessible online? Their research declares as of last year, every second, every second, 128,258 users are watching pornography on the internet every second. The research declares that $8,075 uh, on the average is being spent every second on pornography on the internet. 13,721 people are typing the word adult uh, uh, body into a search engine every single second. Every day, according to the study, 10,037 pornographic videos are created in the United States. 2.5 billion emails containing pornography are sent or received every single day. 108 million search uh, uh, inquiries related to pornography. Um, 316,000 searches related to child pornography every day. How uh, does online pornography affect Americans? Uh, it says that over 5 million people approximately are classified as pornography addicts. 140 million American people regularly visit porn sites. 55% of all internet downloads are related to pornography. 84% of internet users have experienced unwanted exposure to pornographic content through ads, pop-up ads, misdirected links and emails. And one-third of pornography viewers are women. According to this research, family and marital uh, uh, pornographic uh, stats, uh, the negative effects of pornography uh, never end in terms of its development. According to the National Coalition for the Protection of Children and Families, um, in 2021, 77% of families in the United States reported that pornography is a problem in their home. It's a problem in their home. Um, pornography use increases the marital infidelity, according to the study, by more than 300%. 60% of people identified as sex addicts lose their mates. 58% suffer financial loss. And 39% eventually lose their jobs. 68% of divorce cases involve one party uh, that has been involved with pornography over the internet uh, and uh, pornographic uh, websites. The cost of pornography in the workplace. According to this, uh, these studies, the work computer is visited uh, often with employees at, uh, at companies. According to the Nelson Company, the average visit of an employee at work was, uh, 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 was about eight, uh, 18 minutes. During the month, the average worker was to spend three hours and 38 minutes on pornographic sites at work. 
going through the loss of income from that uh, employee or that company three and a half hours um, per month on an average times the hourly wage of that employee times the number of employees nationwide thirty billion dollars a year it's costing businesses uh, in the nation that you and I live in now uh, Job said Lord in, in, in Job 31 1 uh, Lord I dare not want to sin with my eyes and I choose to make a covenant with you not to look upon a woman with lust in my eyes David said Lord put a gatekeeper over my eyes your Bible says when uh, these things are escalating in Luke 17 30 Jesus said as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man uh, sexual addiction uh, even being promoted in public schools I want you to listen carefully for those of you that have children uh, this is uh, a, uh, a, 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 a in Washington DC a school district <coughs> they uh, allocate 23,000 seven hundred and fifty four dollars per student in this school district in Washington DC public school it is more money than any state per student twenty three thousand seven hundred fifty four dollars per student uh, in this school district there is none higher per student other than New York City and with that allocation of these funds, the study says just 23% of the 8th graders in the school districts of Washington, D.C. Uh, were proficient in math and reading. It goes on to say uh, that this, these school districts in Washington, D.C., uh, almost all of them have been required uh, and have done uh, uh, and introduced to the students not a handbook, please listen, but a fist book. It's no longer called a handbook, but a fist book. And basically within it, without taking too much time, uh, what's taking place here, it is actually it, uh, the, uh, the fist book within this public school district is introducing uh, transgender and non-binary identities, listen, to preschoolers, students aged three to five. The uh, article uh, states, even in the fist book, that uh, a large allocation of the $23,000, $754 is being allocated to the teaching of transgender, uh, non-binary identities to children ages 3 to 5. Now I want to really uh, caution you and I, that you're again living in an hour, an age, a culture, a time uh, where um, the uh, integration of um, uh, sexual sins are so prevalent, prevalent and, and so being promoted uh, that we see that taking place not only uh, here in educational areas, um, sports stars, Hollywood, media, uh, public curriculums, church uh, denominations are allowing areas to happen, all uh, at least beginning, if not uh, mostly, embracing um, these areas. And you, as a parent, a grandparent, really need to involve yourself in the aspects of what is happening within that child and within the education and within uh, the actual eye gates and what's happening there. Uh, nine out of ten Christians, according to Barna study, have been infected with sexual sins of some kind. Now, don't, don't be discouraged. I got great news coming for you. I see some are slinking down in that chair and in that sofa. But the gospel, again, when sin abounds... Grace abounds all the more, but it's important you and I know uh, the status and the climate of what's happening within uh, your life and, and the lives that are around us and the institutions. Nine out of ten Christians, according to Barna's study, have been infected with some type of sexual sins of some kind, adultery, pornography, sexual fantasy, masturbations, fornications, homosexuality, lesbianism, identity fracturing, touching, and the list goes on. Now, 
the Bible is replete and filled with God's people that have struggled with sexual sins in their life. I'm going to repeat that to you. And one of the reasons I so love God's Word, He didn't hide the imperfections of those that He had called and that He had chosen even though He knew their weaknesses and their frailties and their tendencies towards these areas and many other sins of the Spirit as well. And yet He put them in the Bible for you and I, the Bible says, to take great encouragement, listen, and to be filled with hope. Okay? David, he had eight wives. He had over a thousand concubines. He was a peepee tom. And he found Bathsheba. And uh, he, he, he ended up having his great general with five stars, Uriah, uh, sent out and had him killed. And yet uh, the Bible declares that Jesus will sit on the throne of David. Look at this one, David. The Bible says God had found a man after his own heart, and yet he was plagued with these areas. But as you follow David's life through repentance and deep areas uh, uh, of conviction within his own heart, God forgave him and uh, justified him, sanctified him, and washed him so much so where the Bible says Jesus sits on the throne of David sits on the throne of David Luke 132 and Isaiah 9 6 through 7 what about Genesis 38 Judah okay uh, Judah was uh, uh, you know he was uh, the tribe of the uh, uh, the worship uh, ministry and a powerful tribe of the 12 and yet he slept with the prostitute Tamar he didn't know uh, the prostitute was literally his daughter-in-law, <laughs> and she she put on makeup and and uh, and fake eyelashes and got her nails done. And uh, uh, as Judah uh, left his home, uh, he encountered this uh, woman by the name of Tamar. And uh, he began to uh, say to her, I want to have relationship with you and go to bed with you. And, uh, and so she charged him uh, um, aspects of, uh, of, of uh, cost and a fee. Um, he lied about uh, sleeping with her and he got caught uh, in his lies. And uh, he ended up having twins uh, with this uh, Tamar, his daughter-in-law and uh, and a, a host of wonderful areas listen now of redemption that took place with the sexual sins uh, of Judah himself Rahab you know the story a prostitute that God had chosen she ended up uh, giving her life to God and married one of the spies named Salmon and if you follow the lineage of uh, Rahab and Salmon, you get Boaz, and you get Ruth, and you get uh, Obed, who had Jesse, the father of David, and you get David, and as you track it all the way down, you get the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone out there watching, listening, that is, uh, again, feeling shamed and guilty and filthy, and, and maybe even your body feels uh, where you, you can't enter into healthy intimacy with your wife, or uh, you're still plagued with condemnation. I want you to hear it again of all of uh, our past, as some of you were, God is able to bring forth the sanctification justification, justification, and washification of not only your spirit and your sins, but your body. I need a shout and an amen out there. Now, having gone to Greece a handful of times and <clears throat> have explored the city of Corinth, I want to uh, share with you a moment concerning this uh, uh, aspect of what Paul faced when he wrote, now listen to me, when he wrote 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians during that time, Corinth in the uh, nation and the, and the uh, world of Greece, uh, that time period, Corinth was known uh, as the sexual uh, uh, city of that known world of that time. 
It was filled even as I went there a handful of times and uh, went and saw uh, the excavations of, uh, of the brothels and the, and the areas of the prostitutes and, and homosexuality and lesbians. The Bible says nothing new under the sun uh, that was taking place. It was the epicenter for sexual immorality uh, orgies, etc., etc. They even had goddesses that were created uh, and uh, blacksmiths that would make them um, uh, to promote what was taking place. The goddess Aphrodite. You've heard of, oh, that food is, uh, is an Aphrodite. Okay, there was coming from the Greek uh, made goddess, uh, goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love, fertility, and orgies and sex. The goddess Demeter, uh, again, another goddess promoting orgies orgies, lesbianisms, homosexuality, the goddess Athena and Diana. And the list goes on as you would walk through the city of Corinth you would see all of these monuments, again, uh, actually uh, uh, not in shame, but actually elevating this uh, sexual uh, immoralities within the city. Paul was called there to Corinth, and listen now, he wrote 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and you and I read that scripture, and he went through 10 areas, and he said, here are some of the areas that you and I, through God's power, will not continue to do therein and then he says as some of you were now uh, again if you were to go back and even to this day for many that are known to be of the city of Corinth especially during that time and generations to follow uh, the word Corinth was the was the if you said you were from Corinth and you were a Corinthian it's like calling someone a four-letter word today Okay, so the, the word Corinthian wasn't something you went, oh, I'm a Corinthian. If someone called you a Corinthian, they were calling you, in today, today's vernacular, they were calling you the dirtiest, nastiest four-letter word that you and I should not know. Okay, <laughs> okay. That, that, that was the most despicable and the nastiest thing you could say and the most perverse thing you could call someone uh, would be a, uh, a Corinthian, would be a Corinthian. But we see here, as you and I read, that again, underlining uh, the, uh, the actual title of our message, God's forgiveness for your body. Uh, it says here in, in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, and we went through all of those areas as some of you were. Now, he said you were washed, sanctified, and justified. Okay, now pause for a minute. Think about if you had Corinthians in your church. Okay, as some of you were. You got, uh, you got uh, lesbians, you got homo past homosexuals, you got uh, non-binary, you got transgenders, you got LGBTQIP, you got pedophilia, you got everything imaginable, and that's who is in your church, okay? Now, think about that, uh, thieves and idolaters and covetors, and, and that's who you're sitting by, and that's who you are taking your family. Family too. I wonder how many of us would go into the Apostle Paul's church and down the road Timothy's church with that kind of congregation. Most of us, we look at the outward, uh, and that is important. God says, I found David, uh, uh, you know, a, a man after I found his heart, and man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart, but he does say the outward appearance is important. He does say that. And so we come into that church with that church filled with these areas. How comfortable would you and I be? I know when we left uh, the Northwest and came uh, to, uh, to uh, Texas, there uh, seems to be quite a bit of a premium based on outward uh, structures and how things look, and not really uh, generally uh, so much about what's going on on the inside, okay? And so there is more of, uh, seems to be in terms of the region, uh, more of a, a, a desire to look good on the outside, and we'll think about working on the inside generally 
generally in terms of just people at large, not necessarily just Christian people. But so you're going to go into that church and you're going to see this. Okay, this is what was happening here in uh, this church that Paul established. Now, he said, some of you were. You're not that anymore. Listen, the power of the gospel and of his Holy Spirit and of the avenue of deliverance can break off every area according to your scriptures in your past concerning sexual immorality. Doesn't matter what it was, what you did, what was happened to you. He says, as some of you were, and I want to declare that to you, some watching and uh, some listening, and you're plagued with these kinds of areas, and I want to declare to you through the gospel uh, and the power of it and the capacity of what we're going to share through this gospel, His Holy Spirit and the power of deliverance can set you and I free in the name of Jesus. Christ. I need a shout and an amen. I'm talking to women that have had abortions. Okay? I'm talking to a host of areas. Uh, 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 God's forgiveness uh, for my body. Okay? I'm touching now just primarily on your physical body. He said you were sanctified and justified and washified. Now, if you have a pen, don't feel you have to, but I want to just remind you of all of these big words that God put in the Bible. And one was, you have been, uh, 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 you have been regenerated or regeneration. So I'm just going to go through a handful of these that your Bible speaks of that we don't really know what they really mean. They're just big, big words, big Bible words like sanctification and justification. And, and I just want to touch on these here for a moment. Uh, you have been, according to your Bible, regenerated. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 regenerated those of you that will take notes regenerated is something God did the actual uh, Greek word there is to recreate you uh, to bring a new birth in your life oh praise <laughs> hallelujah you are you are recreated you're not the old person anymore that is no longer you God did this first Peter 1 3 he rege he regenerated you he brought a new birth he gave you a a recreation and your old life listen isn't who you are anymore quit identifying with the old you the Bible says how can two walk together unless they're in agreement Quit walking in agreement with the old you. That isn't you anymore. You have been regenerated. You have been recreated. You have been given a new birth and a new spiritual transformation and a new nature to the glory of Jesus Christ. He says, number two, that you have been uh, justification, justified, Romans 5.18. Regeneration, 1 Peter 1, 3, something God did. Justification, Romans 5, 18, something Christ did. Something Christ did. Justification, easy thing to remember, just as if I've never sinned. Just as if I've never sinned. Somebody just popped out of bed and started running around the bedroom declaring howlay Hallelujah, because God sees you now through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, cleansing you from your past sins and your sins today and tomorrow. You have been justified just as if I've never sinned something Christ did, okay? A psychiatrist can't do that, okay? A psychologist can't do that. Uh, your hairdresser can't do that. Only Jesus Christ can justify you in the front of a holy, uh, a holy God. Three, sanctification. Sanctification. 1 Corinthians 6.11. 1 Corinthians 6.11, something the Holy Spirit is doing. Well, what's sanctification mean? That's a big old Bible word in there. Is that in King James only? No, it means to continually to separate you from areas of the world and areas of contamination as some of you were. 
God is progressively in some areas bringing you and I out. Some areas, they're instantaneous. It's an event. It took place. I, I know of people that have been addicted to certain areas of nicotine and, and, uh, and other areas, drugs, um, that instantaneously they have been sanctified separated from that other areas it is progressive depending on God's work in your life and mine it's something the Holy Spirit is doing 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11 uh, consecration number 7 1 that is something we are doing consecration number 7 verse 1 something we are to do well, brother, I'm under grace. I don't got to do anything. Well, <laughs> sister, grace doesn't mean you don't do anything. Paul said over and over and over in the book of Ephesians and other places, take off the old uh, man and put on the new man. He says, now, if you used to lie, he says, quit lying. He says, if you used to steal, quit stealing. Those are things you and I do. He's giving you a free will. He'll grace empower us to do his kingdom life and work kingdom uh, diadems, but this life will require you and I, through God's grace, to do some things, and he'll empower you and I to do them. It is called consecration, something we are to do. Something we are to do. Um, uh, glorification. John 17, 1. Glorification. That's something your faithfulness will do. Glorification, John 17, 1. Something your faith and faithfulness will do. What's that mean? The Bible says that God, through Christ, is going to glorify you. Even as God glorified Jesus Christ, He is going to glorify, bring glorification to your life here on the earth and more importantly, in terms of the uh, millennium, the thousand years, and the new heavens and the new earth. He, he's going to put you in a high position and glorify you. He's going to uh, seat you with Christ. Uh, you are going to be heirs with God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. He is glorifying you and it's called glorification. And then lastly, and that's number one, two, three, four, five, six, it's called washification. <laughs> washification. Now your Bible doesn't say washification. It does say washing. I called it washification. So it's right in there with all of the occasions uh, 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 and, uh, and washification. And you could know as we read 1 Corinthians 6.11 and also uh, note, please note Hebrews 10 verse 22 washification and then if you have room write in there Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 and 26 well what's that? washification is something God's word is doing in your life Something God's Word is doing in your life. It's washing you. I'll read uh, Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Paul, again, writing, he is uh, referring to a marriage and then ties it in spiritually and symbolically to him and you and I, his bride. He said, husbands, love your wives even as Christ has loved the ecclesia called out ones, the church, for he gave himself for it. Same husbands are to give themselves to their wives secondarily for Christ first. Verse 26, that he, Christ, might sanctify, sanctification, watch, cleanse it with, the, notice, the washification, the washing of the water of the word. Okay, washification is, the, is what God's Word is doing in your life, um, and it is cleansing us, verse 27, that Christ, uh, that God might present, Christ might present you and I uh, to Himself, a glorious church, not having spots or wrinkles or any such thing, that it sh she should be holy and without blemish. Washification is something God's Word is doing. 
So regeneration, something God did. You are uh, recreated. Uh, justification, just as if I didn't sin. Something Christ did on the cross. Sanctification, something the Holy Spirit is progressively doing, separating you from your past experientially. Consecration, something we are to be doing. And glorification, something that your faith and faithfulness uh, is doing. And then lastly, washification, something God's Word is doing. So we come all the way now uh, in respect to uh, the uh, aspect of uh, uh, you know, God's forgiveness for your physical body. Paul uses this word washed, uh, not only there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, but he also uses it uh, in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. Now, beloved, uh, realize this. Think how excited the uh, Corinthians were in respect to their past sexual immorality. And even if you go back and visit those in Corinth, the aged ones will uh, still realize what a Corinth represents. Again, it represented the most despicable, the most sexually moral, perverse person. Again, if someone were to call you a Corinthian, they, they just let you have it in respect to that ideology of what was happening in the city of Corinth, in, in Greece itself. Again, if you were to go back and see all of the, uh, the sexual goddesses that were promoting uh, these uh, facets of mankind and the statutes that the blacksmiths were making and selling, etc., etc. Imagine when Paul said, you have been washed, okay? Not only, listen now, not only your sins, but he also speaks of your body, being washed. This man who wrote the letter said, my body, I still feel filthy. I still feel guilty. I still feel filled with shame. And he says, not only you have been sanctified, you have been justified, you have been washified through the Lord Jesus Christ concerning, listen, your physical body. Hebrews 10 verse 22, if you have your Bible, I'm going to wait a minute for you to look this scripture up so it ties into our theme today. It ties into our theme today. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. God forgives uh, the, uh, your physical body and the immorality of it. He forgives your body. Hebrews 10, verse 22, Paul writing, Do you have it out there? I want you to work your book. I'm waiting for you, angel. Come on, turn the pages. I'm waiting for you, Gene. I'm waiting you for you, Janine and, uh, and Jean and, uh, and Glendale and, uh, and the host of you. Bless your hearts. Hebrews 10, 22, again, Paul, the writer of Hebrews, Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, listen, with a sincere heart, full in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, underlying this, look at this, and our bodies washed with pure water. The power of what has happened, you have been washed, your physical body has been washed with the pure water of God's Holy Spirit and His Holy Word on your life. You don't need to feel guilty. You don't need to feel shamed. You don't need to feel uh, uh, dirty. You don't need to lack intimacy uh, with your mate or with the mate uh, that God's going to bring to you. You now should know scripturally and by faith you wrap this around your life if you are being tormented by the enemy or by stinking thinking that your body has been washed from every single area of sexual immorality. 
That has to do with abortions, masturbations, fantasies, pornographies, sexual areas, orgies. The, the list goes on. Paul says, according to the Corinthians, as some of you were, you have been washified. He has washed your physical body, not just your sins, not just this, uh, this uh, ethereal uh, uh, work that has happened, but he wants you to know now your physical body has been washed and you are forgiven. I need a shout and an amen because the pandemic that's greater than Omicron, it is sexual immoralities affecting every skin color, every culture. Every area of life you and I live in and we are being infected with it in some levels we declare the truth of this word we have been washified by the Lord Jesus Christ and through his word. Again, you cannot have this take place through um, uh, psychology, philosophy, uh, science, medicine, psycholo psychologists, uh, and, and, and anyone else. It is only through the, the triumphant work of the cross and the declaration of this gospel that your body has been washed. This man that wrote the letter, I know he's not alone. And to now know you have been freed so much so that Paul declares this to the Corinthians in his second letter to them. Are you ready for this? Now think about who's in his church. <laughs> you know, at pastoring almost uh, 30 years, and you know, early on I used to pray for, you know, this one and this guy and this lady, and Lord, bring these, uh, you know, whatever, 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 and, and, and then he began to kind of bring in, you know, those that are enslaved to alcohol and enslaved to, you know, uh, you know sexual addictions, and the list goes on of who we are and who we can be come and the devil's work in our own lives and yet this was Paul's congregation and he writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians in his second book verse uh, chapter 11 verse 2 watch what he says to them now think about the Corinthians again okay think about who he's writing to and what they uh, what they actually mean and this is the second book he wrote to them he says, he says this, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, Corinthians. Okay. For I have betrothed you, married you to one husband, to Jesus Christ, that I would, Paul, present, to, present you, watch, as a pure virgin. Did you just hear what Paul declared to the Corinthians? That he said to them, regardless of what has happened in your past, regardless of how many times you have done this, they were marrying women and, 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 and making love to them and then divorcing them and marrying another one. This one had a role. Uh, this one's got pudgy and they would divorce them. And, and this one did this. And they were rotating through women, uh, you know, like uh, whatever it could be. And he said, in, in, in spite of all of that, the gospel is doing its work. And he says, I, uh, I, I marry you to one husband, Jesus Christ, and I present you as a pure virgin unto Jesus Christ. He washed them and declared over their bodies that God sees them as virgins in his eyes and he wants the Corinthians he wants you and I to realize that you and I through again the beautiful work of uh, sanctification washification justification that he declares you are a pure virgin and he is presenting you to this one Jesus Christ Old things have passed away. Behold, you have been regenerated and your body has been <laughs> washed. Oh, it just makes me cry knowing that he not only took my sins and cleansed me of my sins, but he also has washed my body, washed my hands. He has 
cleansed me from all of those areas and no longer will shame, guilt, and condemnation be your portion any longer, Corinthians. No longer will the abortions and will the adulteries and will the fornications cause you to be saddened in your heart any longer. You and your body has been washed. Won't you stand with me and we'll pray and close out our time together. Uh, Lord uh, Jesus, uh, you know all about uh, you know, our past lives and my past life. And you know about our uh, sexual experiences that uh, we and I have had. And I uh, ask uh, and I'm truly sorry for defiling my body. You have, you have said in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13, that our bodies were made for you and uh, are to be uh, given to you and to honor you with our bodies. And uh, thank you now that you have forgiven me and you uh, have washed my body from head to toe and you have restored to me my virginity. And I uh, thank you and I uh, ask uh, that you would continue to keep that in the forefront when I am challenged uh, by my past and I receive your washification right now in the name of Jesus Christ, washing away all adulteries, all fornications, all pornographies, all areas of masturbations and fantasies, all sins pertaining to my physical body, cleansed and washed from head to toe in the name of Jesus Christ. I am no longer a Corinthian. I am a Christian. I love you. Uh, we honor you. We bless you. We thank you for the power, encouragement, and hope of the beautiful gospel. Help us leave our time together today and, and revel in just plodding along today, just talking about you and sharing of your goodness and uh, cause us to have a smile on our face, oh God, for you have done great and mighty things in us and we are eternally thankful and grateful in the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. If you are able to send any help for the ministry, uh, we have a, a number of areas uh, that we feel God has put on our heart. We don't have a church that supports us. It's from any of you that are able to give. Uh, again, I'll send you a photo once the motorcycle comes in. And um, anything you can do, we are thankful and we are honored. And we thank those of you, uh, the seven this month were able. We bless and honor each of you in Jesus' name. Amen.